Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to Press Play. I am Mike Hume. I'm the editor of Launcher. Thanks for joining us. We have a very special stream today. We are joined by one of my favorite people at the Washington Post, David Betancourt, our comics culture writer. Uh, and he, we're going to talk about something really cool that he's done uh, in addition to his standard work at the Washington Post. Uh, also joining us today is Shannon Liao, who will be on the uh, on the sticks running the Miles Morales uh, portion of this. Hey. Oops. Why is this? Sorry. Technical errors on my fault. It's all me. Hey, bad. I should not be in charge of audio at this stage. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's pick it up from there. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, so, David, um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, why don't you start by telling uh, the folks at home what you do at The Post? Oh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, uh, Mike and I are both old sports department veterans, so we have that bond on top of our love of video games. Um, but I, I'm David Betancourt. I'm a comic book culture at The Washington Post. I write in our style section, which handles every aspect of entertainment you can imagine. My particular beat is focus on comic, focus, focusing on comic book culture. And uh, what that means lately, uh, over the last few years, has really been all of the live action entertainment that's been inspired by comics over the years, whether that be Marvel Studios, whether that be DC Comics recently with the Batman, um, streaming with uh, the Star Wars and everything that's uh, ballooned out of Disney Plus right now. Um, but back in the day, uh, a few years ago, we actually wrote really heavily about comic books, too. And I've been doing it for uh, over 10 years. I've uh, been in style full time the last seven years. And it's a very fun job that, you know, I, I don't take for granted. So how did that, that role come about exactly at the Post? Was this something that existed and then you stepped into it? Or is this something that you had to sort of petition for? Uh, I petitioned for it. Um, I was very lucky in that what I was petitioning for at the time, there was already... Uh, a platform for it. And by that, I mean, we used to have a blog called Comic Riffs. And that was founded by my colleague, Michael Kavna, who's also, mm -hmm. in my opinion, I think one of the best comics writers in the country. Uh, but Mike is a former syndicated uh, cartoonist who's been at the Post for a long time, both as an editor and now as a writer. He covers comic book culture with me as well. Uh, but I was here, I was an editor in the news service, and I came back to the Post, I believe, for three years in 2012. Uh, that was the same year you, you'll recall the Avengers movie came out and made $200 billion at the box office. And that was kind of like a big bang moment, not only for Hollywood, but in my brain in terms of how much a part of Hollywood comics were about to become. So um, at the time, Kevin Merida was here. Um, as I'm sure you know, Kevin's now the head honcho at the Los Angeles Times. Before that, he was at ESPN's Undefeated. Uh, but I used to just walk into his office and be like, you know, I was already writing for comic riffs at the time uh, in a kind of freelance role while doing my full-time duties as an editor here. Uh, but I said, you know, comics are really starting. I said, this is about to get really big. Avengers had just came out. Uh, Netflix had just made their deal with all the Defenders characters, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones. And it was just clear that there was just going to be this huge growth. And the way I explained it was, it was a language that I spoke that, uh, you know, Mike, I'm sure as you know, that's, mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're the few and the proud of us in the newsroom who know who Spider-Man is under the mask, you know, whether it's Peter Parker or Miles Morales, but that's not, you know, I was kind of tooting my own horn for a bit, but I had someone like Michael Kavna, and as Kevin used to always say to me back then, the good thing is, is you've, already, you've already got a place for this content to land. It's just a matter of getting you there in a full-time capacity. And in 2015, um, I got that chance, and I've been in style since. Well, and obviously these days there's no shortage of content for you to tap into. I mean, we look around, we have a new Batman movie on HBO Max right now. We have a new Doctor Strange movie coming out, I think next week or the week after. But, uh, First week of May, May 6th. Yeah, there you go. And then uh, obviously coming off uh, Spider-Man No Way Home as well. Um, and Miles Morales, who I, I would love to talk about with you a little bit now. Uh, so tell me, um, you are a, a co-author uh, of uh, Marvel's uh, Voices series, Comunidades, which came out uh, in February, if I'm not mistaken? It came out towards the end of 2021. Okay. okay. So it was like near the holidays, around, around early December. Got it, got it, got it. Um, so tell me how that project came about, what it is, and how you... So uh, Marvel actually has a comic right here. I can hold it up to see it's... Uh... On the cover here, some of Marvel's most prominent uh, Latinx superheroes, whether it be Ghost Rider, Miles, America Chavez, Nova, White Tiger. Uh, what Comunidades is and what Marvel Voices is, it's an anthology 
And what they did is they tried to get together as many uh, Latino writers and artists um, who weren't necessarily uh, full-time comic book writers, but people who had interest in the culture. Uh, but the goal was to create a comic book full of Latino superheroes written and illustrated and edited by Latinos. Um, I had already had a relationship with Marvel because I had written a couple of essays for them for a previous Voices comic that centered mm -hmm. around their uh, Black superheroes. And I had done that a couple of years before. So I'd written a couple of essays. And then I, I wrote an essay. I don't know how this came about. Um, <laughs> but I wrote an essay about my love of Marvel superhero trading cards, uh, which were a huge part of my comic book education. Just... You know, it's just like a baseball card, but you've got the <laughs> yeah. superhero on the front and on the back, it says all their abilities and how strong they are. Um, man, I absorbed that like a sponge as a kid. So I ended up writing an essay about those cards and how much they meant to me. And it was actually right around my birthday uh, last year. It was a pretty cool birthday gift that I got a, a call from Marvel. And they said, hey, we'd, we'd like you to be uh, a part of this. And how would you like to write your first Marvel comic and it be in a Latino anthology? And... I, I basically said, as long as it smiles, I'm in there. And it's not that I didn't want to do any other characters, but as we can get into later, Miles specifically means a lot to me for a lot of reasons, especially because of my uh, background uh, in terms of who I am as a person. Um, so, so I ended up getting a chance to write Miles, and and it was tons of fun. What What's your reaction when you get that call? Like, it, I think the equivalent for me would be you know, pick up the phone and it's just like, hey, it's, it's Brian Cashman. We want to sign you to contract for the New York Yankees. Uh, when can you get here? Uh, so <laughs> what what was it like just hearing that offer? I don't know if the Yankees can afford you now, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're they're pretty thrifty lately. Yeah. Um, it, it was, you know, it meant a lot to me because I was, I was actually the first reporter. When, when the news, Miles debuted in 2010. So he's been around for about a decade. And when he came out, the, the the way it was framed in the news was, you know, Marvel's half Latino, half African American Spider Man. But nobody was really, you know, as someone that's half Latino, um, just spoiler alert, I'm the same thing Miles is. I have a Puerto Rican parent and I have an African American parent. Um, but no one back then when he came out was asking who he, like, I basically wanted to know what flag he's repping. Latinos were really big into yeah. our flags. Like, you ever watch the World Cup? It's just flag central everywhere. That's it's like such a big part of who we are. But no one had asked. It was just Miles was Latino and black, and that was it, um, or Latino African American, I should say. So I was interviewing Brian Michael Bendis, who's the co-creator of Miles Morales, and I finally just said one day, I was like, "Look, man, I need to know like his mother, Rio, where is she from? Like, and I don't want to hear Brooklyn. Like, I want to hear like ancestrally, where is she from?" And he's like, "Oh, she's, she's Puerto Rican." So I of course then let Bendis know that. I was basically, you know, and he actually said to me, he's like, wow, you are Miles. And that really stuck with me hearing the guy that created Miles uh, say that, you know, this is at the very infancy of me being a, a comic book reporter at the Post long before I started doing it full time. So to get the call uh, from Marvel and, and say, we'd like you to write a Miles story, I felt like it was a huge responsibility um, because I'm the first person who was exactly what Miles is uh, to write him. There's some great people that have written Miles in the past, including Bendis. Uh, many great African-American writers that have had a chance to write them. Uh, Saladin Ahmed is writing Miles now, currently in his Marvel comic series, and a fantastic job. Uh, but I was the first Puerto Rican and African-American person to get a chance. And because this was an, uh, an anthology, it gave me a chance to tackle something that I felt Miles, that wasn't really approached when Miles was written in the comics. Superhero comics are about action. You don't pick up a superhero comic for somebody to talk about their ancestry for 22 pages. You want to see cars being bench pressed and, you know, punches and zooms and baps. Uh, but this was a 10 page story and it was uh, just a chance to, uh, for the first time, have Miles talk about who he is as a person and what that meant to him and how proud he was of it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the, the process in, in crafting the story. Did you, did you sort of already have an idea for for the, the story in mind or was it something where it was just like all right now that i know i'm doing this let me go put my thinking cap on you know go to your your mind palace or or whatever and really come up with something uh, original i actually already had a story in mind and i don't say that cockily to say oh i knew i was going to write <laughs> spider-man one day but you know i'm a writer naturally by craft it's what i do professionally uh, here at the Post, and, you know, so many Post writers eventually 
kind of veer into other things. So I always said, if I ever veered into something else, um, I used to always joke with my big boss. I said, I don't know if I have a book in me, but I may have a comic book in me. Um, so I, I did have a story that always kind of floated in my mind about Miles uh, showing pride in who he was while at the same time recognizing that sometimes people don't see him as what he is. Mm -hmm. um, Latino culture is historically... Uh, they, they've had trouble uh, grasping with the terms of blackness within the community, um, whether it be the Afro-Latino community or whether it just be acknowledging that that community exists. Um, so one thing I kind of want to incorporate it into the story, you know, so at the beginning of the story, Miles is mistaken for a Dominican, which I can speak for, you know, happens a lot. And as someone who loves baseball, it's a huge compliment because who plays baseball better than those guys? Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I decided I wanted to incorporate a little bit of, because this was my one opportunity to write him, but also my one opportunity to address uh, with Miles's voice, uh, what it's like to be someone of that racial uh, mixture. So um, then what, as somebody who has never been exposed to comic book publishing beyond reading them, uh, what happens? You submit a draft, you work with an editor, what's that process like? The first thing you have to do is kind of give a couple of page pitch of how the story is going to play out overall from beginning to end, uh, more or less letting the editors and the artists know uh, the story you're trying uh, to tell. Once that gets approved, it actually, you then have to break it down panel per panel in terms of plotting out not only the action, uh, but what each character is going to say, what they look like when they're doing it, et cetera. So I first started with a couple of page pitch once that was approved. Then we go to actually writing the script, which is a much longer process mm -hmm. um, of, of, you know, setting up each, each panel, whether it be captions, where characters are positioned, what it is they're saying, uh, splash pages with action, stuff like that. Wow. So uh, lengthwise, all told, how long does that take from, from initial idea to fruition? It, you know... I can't put myself in the position of your average comic book writer because the folks who are writing Marvel comics full time, it's their full time nine to five. Obviously, as you know, my full time nine to five is being a reporter here at the Post. So for me, um, I had to write the comic in my free time, uh, which a lot of times was nights and weekends mm -hmm. or early mornings. Uh, so it, it took me about, uh, I'd, I'd say it was a couple, it was only a 10, the average comic book is 22 pages. Um, this was an anthology with many voices. So each story was between five and 10 pages. Uh, my story was a 10 pager. Uh, so it, you know, it was a couple of weeks of, of back and forth with, you know, getting everything down, getting it to the editor. And then there's the back and forth with the editor, but that was a really fun experience because, uh, here at the post, uh, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of being edited by people like Michael Kavna or mm -hmm. Caitlin Moore, people who kind of had this geeky comic book sense naturally, but many times you'll have an editor not into that stuff and you're kind of like trying to explain you know organic web shooters and, and stuff like that so it was a really uh, surreal experience to be writing and being edited by people that knew more about miles than i did that was a lot of fun i would just like to pause briefly to commend shannon on unlocking the single best outfit in miles look, morales look at that that is so yeah the, these these costumes are so sick and uh Miles's original costume to me, because he has a new costume now in the comics, mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty cool. But his original that you know he he starts off with in the game from the comics, to me it's one of the best suits in comics. Um, I actually spoiler alert, I was not happy when Miles originally came out because they didn't reveal who he was under the mask. Mm -hmm. They only showed the suit uh, because you know back then uh, Miles and this to the popularity of Miles. Miles was a part of the ultimate Marvel universe in the comics. The ultimate, ultimate comics at Marvel were kind of like a separate publishing line that were not connected to the main Marvel universe. Uh, so the Peter Parker there died. And I was very angry about it because he was my favorite character. He was a high schooler. Uh, he was around for over a hundred issues. It, it was great. So I remember they showed the original suit in, a, in an advertisement and say, Hey, here's a new Spider-Man. He's coming. And I'm like, I don't know who that guy is, but I hate him. And there's no way they're going to get me to read him. And, and it's literally like the only way they could get me to care is if he were half African-American, half Puerto Rican. And lo and behold, that's what he was. <laughs> because 
because I went into it. I just knew he was going to look like Captain America under the, you know, the Chris Evans version. Like, you know, oh, yeah. blonde and blue USA. And I was just like, but the suit was so cool looking, the, mm-hmm. the black and the red. I was like, all right, well, because I'm, you know, a huge part of why I got into comics as a kid was the art. I used to draw all the time. So I said, all right, I'll check it out for the suit, but I'm not going to like this guy. And then, you know, obviously the rest is history. Now, now here we are talking about it. So, so that leads me to another question because it's, it's been a, obviously a, a topic of discussion now for probably the better part of, of five years, um, and that's just increasing representation in, in enterti- entertainment properties of all kinds, movies, shows, video games, whatnot. So obviously this is a very specific instance where you're you're like, oh, that's not my Spider-Man. And it's like, wait a minute, that is my Spider-Man. What's that like to, to be able to, to see that? Because I don't think you know people like myself... We're, we're used to it. we're used to Chris Evans, right? Um, right? So what's what's that like? What's the tangible takeaway? It you know Miles Miles's arrival is really when I think back about what comic book culture means to me in terms of you know teaching me how to read and my love of art and illustration and my love of creativity. When I think about all the key comic book moments in my life. Uh, other than seeing my dad taking me to see the Michael Keaton Batman movie in 1989, oh, yeah. I don't think any anything in my comic book life ever impacted me as much as Miles's creation, because my you know half African American, half Puerto Rican guys are a dime a dozen in New York, but growing up here in Washington, where you know like the Marines, the few and the proud, it's not a lot of us. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm always used to not seeing myself instead of seeing myself, so. Miles's creation really to, I mean, it's literally something that I, I did not think someone like Miles would ever exist unless I created him myself. And that used to always be a goal of mine if I ever got to comic book publishing one day to specifically create characters that were Afro-Latino, that were African-American and also uh, Latino, you know, bilingual, whatever it may be. Um, it, it, if anything, because there, there's been a lot of resistance to this movement. Um, people who want to call it whatever they want to call it, uh, you know, whether they be old school, whether they just the old guard that likes comics the way they are. Um, there really has been an effort in comics over the last decade to better represent the fandom. And I think social media has played a lot into that too, because they've been able to see so many people from so many different backgrounds that have shown their love of comics. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, I think someone like me is proof positive that efforts like that aren't for nothing because uh, it's really been one of the most inspirational things of my comic book life. Sure, and obviously we, we see it in video games too. Obviously a lot of people will remember the controversy around Last of Us 2 and the decisions they made, the characters uh, being, including an extremely diverse ca- cast, including a trans character. Um, but I, I think it's an era in which we live now where it's just like, you know, we want to be more representative of the world around us. Like, there shouldn't be a monopoly on by any race, creed, culture, religion on uh, on superheroes, on characters. I mean, I think we gain a lot as a society by seeing different characters, different backgrounds, different ways of life um, that ultimately helps us understand one another a lot better. Uh, and I think, I, you know, personally, it's a trend that I continues uh frankly i think it can be done in ham-handed ways but i think the overall point of it is a is a good one yeah every, everyone deserves to see themselves as the hero sometimes you know uh you don't just want to see yourself as a supporting character or a stereotypical character or not see yourself at all you know to see yourself front and center um in a medium that you enjoy is it means a lot uh you know i think ryan michael bendis and sarah Pacelli, the the two that created miles morales deserve a lot of credit because back when miles came out in 2010 uh the comic book industry was not nearly diverse in terms of the mm-hmm. people that create these characters in terms of the writers and artists and editors so it took somebody like brian michael bendis who's one of the biggest writers uh in the industry at the time and is still one of the biggest writers to say hey i'm going to take this opportunity and we're going to throw some groups in here uh, that haven't been represented in terms of being the hero underneath the mask. And that being Spider-Man's mask is a big deal. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about comic book video games now as, as Shannon's diving into action here. So uh, to date, I, we know we, we've established you you sadly have not tracked down a PS5 yet, so uh, you've not yet played Miles. It's my Miles. great shame. 
Yes. No, it, that, it is. That, you are not that, alone, that. my friend. <laughs> no Pulitzer, no PS5. I'm just dying over here. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, both are in your near future here. <laughs> uh, but uh, to date, what has been your favorite comic book property that's been brought to game form? Uh, it's, it's definitely the Smiles game just because it's so well thought out. Um, I, I have some pretty horrid superhero video game stories. I'm old enough to remember the original Superman game on NES. I don't know oh, if you no. ever played that, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I got that game for Christmas, and that's when I realized Santa wasn't real because I was like, if he was, he wouldn't have given me this game right here. It was just <laughs> – so, I, I think I was like eight, maybe nine. But, I mean, Superman couldn't even fly in the game. He would just, like, jump really high. So between that – and back when I was in college, when the first Spider-Man movie came out, I'm sure you remember the Spider-Man movie games from the original trilogy. Yep. Um, I made the mistake of, you know, going online and digging up some cheat codes, and I beat the whole game. And the, the first Spider-Man movie game, based off of Tobey Maguire's first movie, totally ruined the ending of the movie for me. Mm -hmm. So when, when I played the game and that final scene where Toby's fighting the Green Goblin, I, I already knew what was going to happen, and I hate. I'm gonna. There, there's some people that don't mind being spoiled. I personally hate being spoiled. Oh, I go out of my way to not spoil people in my writings or anything like that. If I have some spoiler stuff, I always put a spoiler warning at the top. So I've I've had a dark history with superhero video games. So to see them get to a place like where they are now with this Miles game, in terms of you know the power of the PS5, in terms of the graphics, in terms of playability, in terms of mobility. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it's a sight to see. I mean, you, can, yeah. you can get lost playing a game. I mean, I, I could play this for hours. I think Spider-Man, the previous version, um, was the first game I'd, I'd ever 100%ed. Um, and it's just, just because it is so immersive. It's just fun. Like, my big problem with open word, world games is, is travel. Like, I just I don't like going around the map and walking. It's monotonous and takes forever. But, like, just swinging around on the web is so fun it's yeah. really like the best part of the game so like and it really I, feels like you're doing it yeah yeah so you like i would spend a half hour just going around all the the hot places in new york that i remember from living there you know going into photo mode on you know the empire state building like just killing like a half hour like that it's it's fun it's just they really knocked it out of the park with this game and no, uh this, yeah the graph the graphics are great the the look it, it's smooth and and all the suit i mean they're they got so creative with this i mean a lot of these suits that they created for this game i would love to see make it over to the comics or an animation thousand percent yeah they did a really good job um even better than the uh original spider-man 2018 2018 i think it was 2018 but uh yeah. um and now uh insomniac i believe is going to be behind the upcoming open world well actually we don't know if it's open world but it is going to be a game about wolverine which i am extremely optimistic about wolverine so. is such a great character with so much potential i mean he's, he's got a podcast i mean the the, <laughs> the 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 different ways you can play with wolverine uh is amazing so i'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, that game as well Let's talk a little bit about um, the upcoming slate of movies here. So obviously we just finished uh, Far From Home and, and the next step here, we're uh, heading into the Multiverse of Madness with Doctor Strange. Uh, what do you know? What are you looking forward to? What do you uh, What do you want to see? I can tell you I know absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> Marvel is so tight-lipped with this stuff. I still don't even know when I'm going to see it. I've, uh, I've put in my interview request to speak with the stars. Um, that's always 50 50 um as i'm sure you remember mike i, I had the chances i spoke to tom holland for spider-man mm -hmm. uh no way home did a feature on him that was a lot of fun uh it required me to you know see the film before everybody else so i knew everything that was going to happen and had to just like literally i just be like shaking at my desk because i couldn't talk to anybody about it <laughs> uh doctor i i truly believe doctor strange for a couple of factors I think this movie has the potential to be even bigger than mm. Spider-Man. Now, I know you're saying, right. well, Spider-Man is like the biggest movie in the pandemic era, billion-dollar movie. But yeah. the thing about Spider-Man No Way Home is deep down, we all knew that Toby and Andrew were going to be there at the end of the day. It was mm -hmm. going to be disappointing if they weren't in there. The right. key was just not being spoiled by it. But deep down, all of us with our internal spider sense, we all knew, especially once you saw Alfred Molina and Willem mm -hmm. Dafoe, and I'm like, there's there's no way they're yeah. bringing all these bad guys for the other movies and they're not going to be there. 
The thing with Doctor Strange is we know absolutely nothing. You know, they had the one tease in the trailer where it looked like Patrick Stewart was there. You see, like, the corner of this bald guy's head, and you hear his yep. voice. You're like, oh, my God, is Professor X from the X-Men going to be in this movie? Yeah. On top of the fact that it's directed by the guy who literally is responsible for the current comic book movie, Boom, and Sam Raimi, who directed the first three Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire. Uh, uh, nope. They ought to, uh, I think we've reached the end of your AirPods there. <laughs> oh no. Jane, well, in the meantime, I'm just yeah, you were, you were wrecking some fools here. Side mission. <laughs> Thank you. The movement in this game is just it's so good. Like it, you feel like a superhero just because you can move so well. And I love the finisher moves too. You had a couple, especially with the cat where the cat flies Whoa. out of them and claws. Oh no! <laughs> I fell into the water. <laughs> yeah, I just haven't played this game in uh, about a year, so <laughs> a bit rusty. David, uh, just give us a shout when you get your uh, audio situation straightened out. But in the meantime, we'll enjoy Shannon's gameplay here. I I, I mentioned it before, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to Wolverine. Wolverine was my favorite comic book hero growing up. Um, just what a badass man like if there's there's one person you just don't want to mess with, it's it's wolverine like i even you know even the hulk you know he crossed paths with him he came out a little worse for the wear so um really fun character um i think hugh jackman did a great job with him i'm curious to see if slash when uh the x-men are incorporated into the marvel cinematic universe um who they end up casting because to me the hugh jackson is just iconic uh in that role um i'm just not sure anyone's going to uh measure up quite with the way that uh especially in logan um hugh jackman was just phenomenal in that that one did you see that one shannon um actually yeah i think i did i uh, yeah, that... yeah i love wolverine um yeah, I'm really excited for the new movie. I've pretty much watched like every Marvel movie. So <laughs> I was also excited for David to, to come on this uh, show. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one of the, the more common like, hey, it's the pandemic. I have a lot of time at home. What am I going to do? Like a lot of people are like, let me just watch the Marvel Cinematic Universe in chronological order, which I have not done personally. Um, I think that would be an interesting um interesting task but i it's also one that i think would take about like seven days at this point <laughs> so. oh yeah definitely it's uh it's tough um i i actually wrote an article before about the uh marvel avengers affinity war and you know mm -hmm. people uh if people hadn't watched all the movies what would their experience of that film be because <laughs> you know you have to watch like basically 20 films to really get every single uh kind of clue and joke yeah, and I, and I think that's really one of the challenges for Marvel and Disney at this point is like, how do you continue to onboard people to this franchise without sacrificing a lot of like the ongoing storylines and like the the Easter eggs and the fan service stuff that people who have been watching since uh, the original Iron Man at this point, which was I think it was like 2006, something like that. Um I, David would know. Um, hey, sorry, but, I got bumped off there, guys, for a second. No, no worries, no worries. Um, we were just talking about the, how Marvel's challenge now is to on, continue to onboard new fans to the, the, the cinematic universe properties, while uh, not forfeiting like the the established fans that are um, that have been watching it for the past, you know, however long, like twenty years at this point. Yeah, there there are a lot of people that took a, a streaming deep dive because you know. 2020, a lot of us, you know, were boxed in wherever we were. And uh, I, I honestly think that's a big part of why WandaVision was so huge. It's because mm -hmm. it was the first new Marvel thing that we'd seen uh, since the pandemic started. Yeah. It, WandaVision to me, uh, and we'll talk about Moon Knight. Tell me what the heck is going on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, WandaVision to me was was probably the best Certainly the best of the Disney Plus series. It was most original, most creative. Definitely took some getting used to. I had no idea that, like, the first episode, I was like, so now they're just doing this, like, as a sitcom, but Vision's alive again. That's kind of weird. That's, you know, there, there's something going on. By the end of the episode, you could tell that. But um, it's definitely something that I'm 
uh, I really applaud them for taking that chance and for for doing it. I could definitely see people being like so risk averse. They're like, "You want us to do what? No, 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 no. That's not that's not what we do with Marvel movies." What, what was your impression of it? WandaVision was uh, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, loosely based off of some comics written by Tom King, who's actually a writer who lives here in DC in Capitol Hill. Um, the, the craziest thing about WandaVision was people were enjoying it so much that all these crazy theories started happening, like uh, Marvel's version of the Devil Mephisto is going to appear mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. And basically, the, the creators kind of had to come out right before the final episode came out and was like, hey, guys, none of that stuff is in the last episode. Yeah. So just just enjoy it for <laughs> what it is. Uh, but no, it was uh, WandaVision was great and and really, to me, set the standard for what Marvel can do in terms of, you know, not making streaming series, multiple chapters. Uh, I, I really think that everything that, that has come out since, including Moon Knight, uh, and we'll get that comparison to WandaVision just because the impact of WandaVision was so great. Let's uh, check in with the chat really fast. And then uh, I, I need you to explain Moon Knight to me because I just <laughs> I'm totally lost. Uh, from uh, Stupid Suck 1010, the Arkham <laughs> games are my favorite any medium. That is true. Those are good games, man. Uh, also, Slow Hands In. I'm trying so hard not to uh, expectations too high for the Wolverine game. Kind of played myself with the Avengers game. Truth. Avengers yeah. was not good at yeah. all. <laughs> Like I like the I like the storyline behind the single player campaign, but just from the aesthetic, like it looked like Captain America assembled his costume from Home Depot. And it's <laughs> like that should never be the case. Come on, like what are we doing here, Dave? Did you play that one? I did. For, I, I downloaded the thing, and that was enough for me. Not you know, if anything, I think games like Avengers help you appreciate games like Miles Morales a little bit more in terms of seeing that it's not easy. It's not as simple as just throwing in a bunch of cool characters and being able to fight with them. Uh, there's really got to, you know, there's got to be a connection somewhere. And I think that's something that the Miles Morales game achieves where you really get lost in it. And I think that was, uh, now granted, again, I'm someone that only played the beta, but that's just initially how, that was my initial reaction to, to that game. Yeah, our, our colleague and friend Gene Park had a really good take on the, which is like, it's almost impossible to make because you had to balance all the characters. And it's just like, look, the Avengers are not balanced. Like, the Hulk yeah. is the Hulk. <laughs> like, right. he's going to rock you. Like, Thor is a god. Like, if it, they went head to head against Hawkeye, Hawkeye's going to have a really bad day. <laughs> but they need to find a way to balance them so it's just like one character isn't totally broken and the other one's totally useless um so that's think, a challenge I, yeah i think it shows that you know all of these characters are so great for example you mentioned hawkeye hawkeye was a fantastic disney plus show but mm -hmm. i don't know if that's a guy that i want to play as in a video game you right. know there's a there's a there's a drop off there in terms of do i want to be this person when i'm gaming um, I don't think that's the case with Spider-Man just because of all the, the many different things he can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, depending on who the character is, that that's totally going to determine how uh, hyped I am to play a game. Um, one more comment from Stupid Suck. Uh, no idea how they messed up offending Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy, I still haven't finished, but the story in that is very good. I, I have a... I, I didn't enjoy the gameplay mechanics as much, at least so far. I'm only a couple hours in. I just haven't had time. Uh, but David, have you had the chance to play that one as well? I've not played Guardians. Uh, those are characters that I love. And I, I really think more than any other franchise or any other comic, nothing has shown the power of what Marvel Studios has become in Hollywood, more so than the Guardians of the Galaxy. Because even me, someone who's been reading comic books since they were seven years old, six years old, mm -hmm never came across those guys whatsoever when that movie was announced i'm like there's a raccoon and a talking tree like <laughs> what, what what's what's going on here and it totally worked and now they're household names um right i i really think that is one of marvel's strongest brands and really uh shows their strength because this is, this is a huge library they have of characters so you know we just established that you know playing as hawkeye and avengers isn't that fun but there are a whole lot of other characters elsewhere that might be able to translate to a fantastic game and i think Characters like the Guardians are one of them. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And now, um, you know, the Guardians are led by Mario. 
So there's that as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that'll well, well not only that, but they have a they they also although I think it's only going to be for a blip. They're going to be in the new Thor movie in July. I don't know if you just saw the trailer. That I did see the there. trailer. Yeah, it's it's worth it. But you know, just the the comedic bromance between uh, the Chris's oh, yes. uh, <laughs> is 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 quite hilarious. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm there for that for sure. Um, the last Thor movie, um, the title which is eluding me right now, Ragnarok. Uh, Ragnarok. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so good. Taika Waititi is just such a good director. It's a nice blend, those two. Oh, yeah, it's terrific. And they, those, those, those movies feel uniquely his, and that's not easy to do in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because most directors get there, and the story's already ready, and Kevin Feige already knows what he wants to do. They already know where they want things to blow up. So Taika Ty really came in there and really kind of put his vibe into those movies. All right, so speaking of vibes, what Moon Knight? I mean... Obviously, you have a schizophrenic character, uh, at least with split or split personalities, I should say. Um, you have a lot of Egyptian mythology, which is very, um, and you have, you know, I don't even know. It's like the last episode, really, I was just sort of like, he's in an asylum now. Like, is this you real? Didn't, you didn't is like the not... at the end. I don't understand, <laughs> David. Make it make sense. So, so Moon Knight, uh, as in the comics as well, and also shout out to Oscar Isaac for being the first uh, Latino actor to get a lead role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, I had a chance to talk to Oscar a couple of weeks before Moon Knight came out for a feature. That was a lot of fun. Um, but this is a character in the comics. He's in the comics. He's a mercenary uh, who has, you know, dissociative uh, identity disorder, and uh, he forms a bond with Khonshu, the Egyptian god of the moon, and he basically becomes the avatar for that Egyptian god. And so Khonshu, the, the the guy with the with the bony beak that like follows him around and it talks to him in his mind, that guy gives him his powers. He's the god of the moon. He's the Egyptian god. Uh, moon Knight dabbles into a lot of Egyptian mythology that I think I think a lot of us here in the States are more familiar with kind of like the Greek gods, but we yeah. don't know too much about Egyptian mythology. Um, it's been a real fun deep dive, but, but the, the thing I like about Moon Knight is after four episodes, we still don't know if we're really in any type of reality or if this is all just playing in Mark Spector's mind or Steven's mind, you know, depending, there's also another identity, uh, Jake, uh, in the comics who we've yet to meet that a lot of people think he'll be showing up in the fifth episode that comes next week. Um, but Moon Knight is just a chance for Marvel Studios to get a little weird um, I had a chance to speak with Mohamed Diab, the, uh, one of the executive producers, directors, and writers on the show. And the, you know, these Marvel series on Disney+, Plus, they're not beholding themselves to uh, everything that happens in the comics, so they can take a few more chances. I think that's why Moon Knight has such a different kind of psychological vibe. Um, but the best way I could sum it up for someone like you, Mike, who's kind of saying what's going on is, is that the lead character doesn't really know what's going on either, so we're going to figure it out <laughs> with them at the end. <laughs> All right. Well, that's reassuring that it's not just me. Uh, I was, you know, the couple of nights I've watched it, I usually do watch an episode like, yeah. just to wind down at the end of the night. Uh, I'm just sort of like, what is in this beer? Like, I am tripping out. Um, but it's enjoyable, though. It's, it's definitely <laughs> enjoyable. I, 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 And I know it's a limited series, so it's not going to be uh, on, ongoing indefinitely. Do you right, think... Only, only two episodes left, six episodes total. Right, right. So do you think that there is... Um, you know, the a plan for Moon Knight to make a, a movie appearance at some point. You know, I, I asked Mohammed about that, and this series more than really anything else that Marvel has done, both in the movies and on Disney Plus, feels as disconnected from the rest of the MCU as anything they've ever done. Mm. Like uh, they had initially planned for maybe some other heroes to make cameos, just because that's something that always happens in the MCU. Uh, but they decided that they had something unique enough that they didn't need to do that. So I don't think this is the last we've seen of Moon Knight. Um, I don't wh whether he gets an entire new season, we don't know. But I definitely think he, he's a character that could pop up somewhere else in the future. Now, refresh my memory because this I, I never read the Avengers that closely. I was more uh, X Men Spider Man fan. Um, but was Moon Knight ever part of the Avengers? Yes, um, he he's been a part of a lot of different uh 
groups in the comics. I, I recall some amazing Spider-Man comics in the 90s drawn by Mark Bagley, uh, one of my favorite uh, Spider-Man artists where it was like Spider-Man, Moon Knight, Night Thrasher, The Punisher, where they'd all be kind of running around and stuff like that. Um, he, he kind of seems like, I don't know. I mean, at least the way they're presenting him right now, he doesn't seem like the best fit to kind of be hanging out with the Avengers. And I think it's kind of the vibe they want to give for now. Um, but uh, Marvel Studios has a new, uh, I think it's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be a Halloween special, uh, like Werewolf by Night. And it's got, uh, ah, who's the lead actor? Uh, Gael Garcia, I believe, mm -hmm. um, is, is going to be the lead actor in that. And those are two characters, the Wolfman and Moon Knight. Moon Knight actually made his first ever appearance in a Wolfman That's right. uh, comic. So if anything, I think that Wolfman series coming up, that Halloween special, I, at least I think it would be really cool if he popped up there. If he, you know, if he doesn't, I'm not going to pitch a fit, but I think <laughs> that would be pretty cool. All right. Well, you can't talk about Wolfman without talking about Dracula. So let's talk a little bit about Morbius. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Listen. I, 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 I So I saw Morbius about a week before it came out, uh, put in a request to talk to Jared, uh, didn't go through. Here, here's the thing, Mike. So do you, re you remember that, you know, say right after the first two Spider-Man movies came out between like 2004, between 2004 and 2007, where you had movies like Ben Affleck's Daredevil and Electra, yes. which was horrible. Regrettably, yes. Yeah, yeah but... but if, if Morbius would have came out back then, mm -hmm. I think people would have been like, hey, the, the, you know, good for Marvel for trying. Yeah. But when you have this huge body of work from Marvel Studios, um, that's really, and, that, and that's why Spider-Man is in the MCU now, even though he's a Sony character. Mm -hmm. It's because they realized they couldn't compete with the might of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and people didn't care as much because he wasn't intertwined in what they had built. Now, you know, Sony has the rights to all of the Spider-Man characters, and they always will. And it's always going to be a good business decision to at least try. Uh, but Morbius, you know, I, they're going to have to decide, can we keep trying to make these movies that we know Spider-Man isn't going to be in? Is it right. enough? Will people care enough just because this is a character that we know could bump into Spider-Man but likely won't? And that's a tough decision to make because... You have to keep trying because if you don't try, you know, you eventually lose the rights. You know, you have to keep reloading the blaster every couple of years because if not, Marvel, you know, that's how Marvel was able to get back Daredevil and the Punisher and mm -hmm. all those characters that were in Netflix because Netflix just stopped after a while. And once you go null for a little bit, you know, Marvel Studios will come back and Disney and they can wrap it all up. Sony is never going to let. I mean, look at this fantastic game that we've been talking right. over for the last... Uh, Sony's never letting this go. That would be like, you know, giving your gold egg-laying goose away <laughs> for free. It's just not going to happen. So while we have success stories like this fantastic Miles game on the PS5 and No Way Home, which they can share in the glory with Marvel Studios, because that's a joint effort, mm -hmm. uh, part of not giving up those rights mean continuing to have to try. So you're going to get a Morbius every now and then. They have other characters like Craven the Hunter, Black mm -hmm. Cat. Uh, they were trying to do a Sinister Six movie. That was something they were trying to build up for in Andrew Garfield's uh, Spider-Man movies. But, you know, we have to, with this Sony situation, we're going to have to take the good with the bad. Uh, you know, for example, I think Venom's one of the coolest characters ever. He's one of my favorite characters as a kid, especially when Todd McFarlane was drawing him. Uh, but I, I'm not a big fan of those two movies, and I love right. Tom Hardy. I mean, right. Tom Hardy as Bane is one of my favorite comic book movie oh, things ever. Sure. Uh, sure. But it, it's not always going to work, especially if Spidey's not. You know, the the, the, the secret ingredient in the sauce is Spider Man. Um, you know, if if you say it's it's like somebody always saying, yeah, I know LeBron James, uh, but you never see LeBron James. You know, eventually you're going to say, all right, well, where's LeBron? You know, so <laughs> it's it's kind of the same thing with what Sony's been trying to do lately. Yeah, no, I could totally see that. I could totally see that. And and I think maybe w one of the solutions that I would I would propose modestly is to let those movies with the more fringe characters um, almost be 
more like an independent movie. Like, you know, you, you uh, have a deeper plot, more character driven and less like just the the superhero movie, you know, checklist uh going down just like, oh, we have the origin story movie and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um to me I think that might be a little bit more interesting. Um and and like if the character isn't totally beloved and if it's just like, you know, um it's like, you know, uh, the scene in um, Avengers Endgame when they're in the, the diner and like Paul Rudd's like I'm Ant Man. They're like the kids like yeah, cool, yeah, whatever. Just yeah, I'm gonna go hang with the Hulk now. Um, right. right. Yeah. Like if they they could find a way to the story and and the just like the cinematic drama of it can carry the movie a little bit more than just the character of the, you know, the comic book character, I should say. Well, look um, at the, look at the Joker movie recently. I think that's exactly. a perfect example. Good example. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I totally see what you're saying there is that if you know the big time superhero can't be there, don't try and make it a big time superhero movie. You know, you can totally try and veer in another direction tonally uh, in terms of the vibe of the movie, but you know, we'll see. For now, Sony's still trying to prove they can make superhero movies. If anything, I think their biggest hope is one thing Spider-Man No Way Home did, and I know this for a fact because I, I wrote a whole appreciation kind of apologizing to the guy, is everyone loves Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man now and kind yeah. of realizes that he kind of got a bad rap because his movies came out, his first movie came out 2012 when The Avengers came out, and by the time the sequel came out in 2014, 2015, you know, people were already enamored with the MCU mystique and a Spider-Man movie just wasn't what it was. That's a little different now. Now that Andrew's come back and he's kind of on this new award tour of being Spider-Man again, I don't think he would ever do it again. Mm -hmm. But I think if Sony wanted to spruce up their universe again, they'd have to try and get uh, and, you know, someone like Andrew to suit up or now that Raimi's directed another Marvel Studios movie, maybe see if he'd be interesting in getting the gang back together again. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting for sure. That would be interesting for sure. Um, all right, so looking forward, and, and we can start to uh, start to wrap up a little bit. Um, but right now, it feels like we're we're on the upslope. Like we're on. We're, we had that lull between Endgame and and now, but with No Way Home, the Multiverse of Madness, very closely related. Um, it feels like we're on the the, the ascent again. So. I want to hear some theories, fanboy theories. I don't care. Like you, you said, you don't know anything. I'm not entirely sure uh, that's the case. But uh, regardless, uh, let's 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 spitball here. Um, where are we going? Who's the big bad that's going to be coming through in the next couple uh, movies or so? Well, uh, what we do know is uh, Jonathan Majors, who appeared, made his first MCU appearance at the end of the Loki series. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be Kang, Kang the Conqueror. And so that is basically the next big MCU bad guy, maybe for the next five years or so, that could result in a new Avengers team forming. Who, who would be on that roster? Whether it would be Anthony Mackie's Captain America or uh, Moon Knight or America Chavez is making her first appearance in Doctor Strange. You know, that, that we still don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that Jonathan Majors' as Kang is going to be a big enough deal that it could result in new Avengers movies coming from that, you know, he, he made his first appearance in Loki. He's going to appear in Ant-Man, Quantumania, which, by mm -hmm. the way, it, it, whenever people ask me, what is the most successful thing Marvel Studios did? I always say they've made three Ant-Man movies, not one, yeah. not two, but three. Amazing. That's when you know you're, you're doing it right, because even as much as I hungered for these type of movies as a kid, because, Mike, you're, we're kind of in the same range where we grew up and these movies just weren't around other than yep. Keaton playing Batman. Uh, there's totally this chance for, you know, just something special to happen with Majors as Kang. And I think that uh, they're, they're, they're marching towards that. But, you know, we've, we've had three Ant-Man movies and that's just ridiculous. But uh, <laughs> I, I think there's totally a chance that uh, one in the next Ant-Man movie, he'll be I think the next Ant-Man movie with Majors as the villain there is going to lead us to the next big thing, maybe even more so than the Doctor mm -hmm. Strange movie that's about to come out. Interesting. The Doctor Strange movie is just going to be this huge mind flip of what are all the spoilery secrets? That's what's going to get everybody to the theaters opening weekend. You know, are the X-Men going to show yep. up? Because that's something that Marvel Studios 
you know, we, we got the play action pass with WandaVision mm-hmm. when the when the guy who was Quicksilver in the X-Men movies showed up. Uh, and we were like, oh, my God, here come the X-Men. And they were like, nope, yep, just, just kidding. kidding. <laughs> uh, so we'll, 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 we'll you know, my biggest thing from Doctor Strange is going to be, one, who we see, and two, is it real? Because, you know, Patrick Stewart could show up as Professor X, but it doesn't mean it's going to stick in terms of the continuity. But the sky's the limit. You know, Mar- Marvel is, they're playing with house money now. Uh, they, they have a fandom that trusts them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a matter of waiting and seeing. Yeah, I mean, personally, the, to me, the, the X-Men question is the biggest one, just because that that's my series growing up. I mean, I, I think I have at least 100 comics sitting somewhere in that closet behind me, actually, uh, that I, I Don't we all? growing up. Yeah, and, and <laughs> so... I, I'm 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 anticipated uh, or I'm excited, but I have nervous anticipation because you know if if it's Patrick Stewart who I love, terrific Professor X, uh, I just want him to continue to be Professor X because right now they have an opportunity to recast the entire entire uh, crew, and I almost want them to do that as much as I love how they cast uh, a lot of the uh, X Men and the the Fox movies, which were not good uh, for the most part. Uh, I would love to see them just start fresh and and build off characters that will be around for a while rather than have somebody who's just like, oh, I'm here for a cameo. And you have Patrick Stewart as Professor X once in, in one movie. And then you end up with, you know, some like 28 year old with a shaved head in the next movie, you know, <laughs> James McAvoy. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> uh, that, I think when it comes to the X-Men, their future, I mean, so many of us were influenced by the 90s comics of Chris Claremont and Jim Lee, as well as uh, the animated series that appeared on Sunday mornings, I'm sorry, Saturday mornings, uh, when we were kids. So uh, I, I think the thing with the X-Men is Marvel can take their time. They've got so much other stuff going on that they don't need to rush that right away. Um, we do know there's going to be somewhat of a revival of the animated series soon on Disney+. Plus, uh, But otherwise, I don't I don't think they're they're ready to pull that card just yet. But... Who knows? I haven't seen Doctor Strange yet, so yeah. uh, you can you can send me a Slack message on on May seventh. We will <laughs> find out very soon. <laughs> very soon. Uh, well, well, David, thanks again for joining us. Always a pleasure. To, uh, look, uh, Shannon, excellent work clearing out that side mission. I just this is perfect timing right here, and a lovely scene by the way. That I I really like their relationship in this game. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is all like after you finish the main game, you get additional scenes with people in the neighborhood so yeah thanks so much for uh uh joining in on the stream everyone yeah we'll see you guys next week uh we're here every week for press play uh remember to like it and subscribe so you can every friday uh and join us on thursdays for washington post story mode where we go over the biggest and most important video game news of the week uh again once again i'm mike hume thanks for joining us we'll see you next week bye take care everyone